I hereby call the City Council Finance Meeting for yeah. Tuesday, February 18th, 7 p.m. to order. <laughs> Good evening, Sorry. Councilors. Sorry. Before we uh, start our meeting, um, Councilor Fowler. Yeah, I'm sure. Madam Chair and colleagues, uh, I'd like to just take a couple of minutes to remember a couple of Brocktonians who unfortunately have passed on. Stand up? First one is Maybelline Bennett. Uh, if ever there were a gentle lady, it's Maybelline. She worked tire tirelessly for National Night Out crime prevention, community crime watch. Um, she died way too young, and I send, I along with all of us, our condolences right. and prayers to her family. And the other person who passed away is Officer Jack Hill from the Brockton Police, better known as Jack Hill at the Brockton Housing Authority <coughs> Security. I worked for many years with Jack. Uh, tremendous sense of humor, <coughs> fun person to be around, serious when he had to be. Uh, most of you don't know what it's like to wear a uniform and have a brother or sister officer and you watch out for one another on the job. So if we could have a moment of silence for both those individuals. Thank you. May they rest in peace. Our condolences with their family. Thank you, Councillor Farwell. So before we begin uh, this evening, Councillors, um, before we start the agenda, actually, I would just like to recognize that Mayor Sullivan is in, cha is in council chambers, and um, he is ready to answer any questions on any of the items on the agenda, uh, even though he's not an invited guest on some of the items. If anybody feels um, they need to ask him any questions, please, uh, he said he'd be willing to answer. So. Um, Madam Clerk, number one. Ordered acceptance and expenditure of the grant award in the amount of $623,808.04 from Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, Office of Grants and Research 2020, Senator Charles E. Shannon, Jr., Community Safety Initiative Grant to Brockton Police Department 2020, Senator Charles E. Shannon, Jr., Community Safety Initiative Grant Fund. Invited Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Emmanuel Gomes, Chief of Police. Good evening, Mayor. Madam Chairman, uh, members of the committee, good evening. Um, Councilors, this is just, um, this money is from a state grant program. It's designed to reduce uh, gang violence. We do have the police chief here. We also have Mr. Clarkson. Um, but we're very fortunate for the city of Brockton. It's a high dollar amount. Uh, it's a non-matching grant. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Um, on the motion? Um, Councilor Nicastro. Thank you. I just had a few things to say. Um, I, I wanted to express congratulations and kudos because I went through my file since I became a city councilor. In FY18, we received $290,000 for the Shannon Grant. In FY19, we received $544,527 in change. <coughs> and of course, this year, we're getting about $79,000 more. That's just absolutely amazing and wonderful. And also, I'm fortunate that one of my constituents wor works as part of, you know, on funds allocated to the Shan from the Shannon Grant. And um, that person wrote to me tonight, and if you don't mind, I'll just read her brief statement. Um, Looking forward to continuing connecting our young people to caring adults on our outreach team and assisting them with key resources such as basic needs, employment, mental health and wellness, safety planning, violence prevention mediations, and conflict resolution to deter street violence in the city and continue impactful work with the schools such as our mediation training we do with middle school youth or our work with the Keith Center students and the great staff there. 24-7, young people need to know outreach workers are there to help and build peace in our city. That's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cha Ms. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor. And, and Madam Chairman, if I could, uh, Councilors, when I sat up there for 14 years, we had been told in the past uh, that the, uh, the grant uh, person at the Brockton PD, as well as the crime statistician, would not be coming before this body. We all remember that, those that were here. Uh, that's a falsehood. I've met with them last week. Uh, they're ready, willing, and able to come before us uh, with Chief Gomes. Uh, I would encourage any of you or all of you to file a, res a resolution. The statistics and the uh, information they gave me 
as a uh, con former concert at large was uh, really, really impressive. So again, they, they, they're ready to come. So at your beck and call, they'll be here. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor. We'll be working on a resolve for that. I have Thank you. request. Thank you, Madam comments. President. Uh, so a motion has been made. Uh, and a motion, Ma oh. Madam President. Councilor Thompson. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I know you just stated that uh, potentially the uh, grant um, coordinator would come in and, and, and speak to these issues. So may, uh, maybe some of these questions are, are, are better directed towards them. But while we have uh, both the chief and yourself here today. Um, so uh, this seems to be a fantastic grant. Um, reading it, it looks like it really has the potential uh, to help Brockton. Um, so I'd like to have a discussion and ask a few questions. So whoever has the answer, please uh, feel free to uh, come forward. So from my understanding, it looks like it's a $623,000 state um, grant. And then uh, the city will be providing about 244000 of its own money for a, a total of uh, 868 hundred thousand dollars is, is that correct council it's an in-kind so it's not a hard dollar amount that the city would be uh, con contributing so when i said there's no match there's no hard dollar amount it's just an in-kind based on that value so from uh looking at the um <clears throat> the paperwork that was submitted it looks like um the the city has designated two hundred and forty four thousand dollars uh to add in addition to this grant or where would that number come from uh, looking at the um, the, let's say that the, the budget or the printout, um, it looks like it has specific city side expenditures of which total $244,000. I'm just, is, is that correct? Yes. Councilor Troy Clarkson, chief financial officer. Uh, I'll speak generically, typically with in kind matches. Um, those monies come from funds that have already been budgeted. So the in-kind contribution uh, for grants like this come from monies uh, that this body has already approved through the budgeting process or through other existing funds. So it doesn't require an additional appropriation by the city council to support the grant. So, so those are funds that are, have already been budgeted for the police department generally? <coughs> In most cases, yes, yeah. Like, like I said, and, and, and I'm, Speaking generically again, in some cases there are funds that exist outside the budget from previous appropriations that have been made. So, but the the key is there aren't any additional appropriations required to to fund this. I did, w w while I uh, have the floor, I did send all of you a link. Um, the Commonwealth actually compiles statistics on the impact of these Shannon grants, and I, I sent you a link so that you can actually see the impact that the previous uh, Shannon money has had on public safety in the city of Brockton. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> so secondly, it looks like uh, that, um, uh, my question is, is the Brockton Police Department, do they basically have command and control over uh, this grant, the expenditure of this grant? It looks like, uh, this funds some collateral duties for some Brockton Police Department officers. And so I was wondering if there's one person or a team of people which coordinate all the efforts that are um, being funded under this grant. Hi, uh, good evening. Um, if I may uh, answer that. Uh, these programs are all coordinated through the Brockton Police Department. I can tell you as a general overview that the Shannon grant provides vital services and outreach that would be nothing short of impossible for us to do. Um, this, is, uh, this, this grant has, has evolved, it's been around for many years, and it continues to evolve and get bigger as more demands come in. Um, there's a, a great number of outreach programs that go with this uh, youth-oriented um, domestic violence and a great uh, deal of other things. Uh, and we continue to evolve to the problems that we're facing. Uh, but we maintain the, the nucleus of the, of the control of it, and, uh, and we partner with a lot of people to do all the outreach. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, Chief. So um, as you said, there are, there are many different partnerships uh, in this grant, uh, the Old Colony, YMCA, Kids Connect, uh, Boys and Girls Club. So um, th that, with the Brockton Police Department basically um, <coughs> have an eye on that, on all of the funds being submitted to these different organizations. And, um, you know, how do we, and I know, uh, Mayor, you talked about some of the statistics. 
Um, so somebody is keeping the statistics about um, what improvements these are making for the community or uh, how they're affecting the, your, your job as a uh, law enforcement officer. Um, you know, I, I just want to know, since there's a lot of money, a lot of different moving parts here, whether there's a, 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 a somebody coordinating all of these efforts. Yeah. Yes, Councilor. The, the total coordination of the grant is done in-house at the PD, and we also have another individual that maintains the stats to basically substantiate the, the revitalization and the reapproach of this grant year after year. Uh, this, is, this is an ongoing uh, application process, if you will, and we must maintain the stats to be able to qualify once again. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Council, the other, the other thing, since it's a, it is a significant amount of money, it's also public funds, so there's a steering committee attached to it, and there's an evaluator attached to it to make sure that it's followed through and it's evaluated and the stats will be given back to the municipality, in this case, the City of Brockton. Okay. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Mayor. Thank uh, you. Thank you. I have no further questions, Madam President. All set, Councilors. Motion's been made and properly seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion carries uh, favorably back to the full city council. Madam Clerk. Ordered acceptance and expenditure of the grant award in the amount of $30,823 from Executive Office of Public Safety and Security, Office of Grants and Research, Highway Safety Division, FFY 2020 Sustained Traffic Enforcement Program STEP Grant to City of Brockton Police Department, FFY. Y 2020 Sustained Traffic Enforcement Program Step Grant Fund. Invited Tory Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Emmanuel Gomes, Chief of Police, John Hallisey, Captain Police slash Traffic Commissioner. Good evening. Madam, Madam President, uh, uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, Councilors, what this is, these funds are for the uh, Traffic Enforcement at Brockton PD. And we do have Captain Hallisey here as well if you have any specific questions. But this, uh, this dollar amount is uh, is significant and uh, it has a beneficial impact uh, on traffic enforcement at Brockton Police Department. Cap, do you have anything else to offer on that? Councilors, any questions? Any quick question for Captain Hallisey, please. Councilor Cruz. I'm not sure it's actually part of this uh, grant, but um, Traffic Commission late in the year, I know they voted for some signage and a specific call by coincidence today from um, signs up on West Elm Extension. When will, uh, are you waiting for new budget monies to put some of the signs up that you, that the board approved or have they been put up? No, we're just waiting for the signage. We have a Waiting for the guy. signage, yeah. so it's, you're yeah, in process and just not up yet. Yep, they, they, they must be far behind on that. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna let me cut. Uh, Councilor Thompson down. followed by Councilor Nicastro. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> good evening, Captain. Uh, Captain, do we know when this enforcement will start or is this? Right this, away. Wait, so once, we get the once, money once it's appropriated, enforcement will start. And we're hoping to get another 30000 make it 60000 after after this. <coughs> and then are we able to know um, how many citations or fines that are derived from this specific grant? Yeah, we'll have all those stats. Okay, great. Um, so it's four an hour. You have to have four stops an hour. For, okay, so there's already there's requirements attached to yes. it. Yes. Okay, that's interesting. Um, also, um, you, you, you put a list of the streets and intersections uh, that are uh, gonna be the focus of this um, uh, traffic enforcement. Um, is, is that, it, I guess my question is, would we be able to provide that information to the, the residents so they, they know what's, what areas where this higher enforcement's being um, directed towards? Uh, not not in a an attempt to like tip them off, but just to say, hey, look, we take this serious. This is what we identify as problem areas. We're going to direct city enforcement into these areas, and you know that they may want to know what those areas are. I have no problem with that. Okay. I'm just. <clears throat> I know peak hour traffic uh, in Brockton can be a nightmare, so uh, I'm really hoping that strong enforcement can help alleviate that issue. I appreciate your time tonight, Captain. Thank you. Okay. Are you all set, Council? I, I am. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Council Nicastro. Thank you very much. Good evening, Captain Hellesy. Thank you for being here. So most of these funds in this grant 
are for police overtime to conduct high visibility traffic enforcement of streets of high volume of accidents and injuries during peak hours. And I noticed there's a list inside here. And unfortunately, only one, one of the, the streets and intersections listed is in Ward 4, and that is Montello Street at East Nilsen, which I get a ton of calls about. As you know, we've been into the traffic commission on it. So I'm delighted that this is happening. I wish there were more Ward 4 streets. But overall, this is just a very good thing. I'm very pleased you will have these funds to work with. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, um, thank you, you Madam Chair. Just, if, I, if I could, um, I just actually, before I came in, I went to the uh, OCPC, Councilor Castro. I went to the OCPC with Mary Walder in the uh, Main Street Corridor. Jack yes. Lally, Councilor Lally was there, and State Representative Jerry Cassie. Yes. That exact location you talked about is on the top 200 of, of Mass Dot. So it's a very, very um, dangerous location. Yes. And that's one of the reasons why it shows up on the queue. Yes, and actually, Councilor Lally was filling me in on that meeting this evening. We had a count, so I wasn't able to attend. I guess what's also on that top 200 list is Main Street and Nilsen Street. That's and correct. of course, I have people from a church there who did a petition. I've been getting a lot of, uh, of calls to put a, a street light or something there. And I think we were told at Traffic Commission two months ago, Captain, that OC, it would be referred to OCPC. So that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Councilor Ianieri. Uh, thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Chairman, and good evening, Captain. How are you? Good. Um, I, I am pleased to see that um, the one most important street that I have uh, <coughs> difficulty, <coughs> excuse me, where there's West uh, Chestnut Street. And as you know, we were, we were both there with the uh, other members of the um, subcommittee this morning um, looking at, at traffic at West Chestnut and, and Southworth Street. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, we can start, as you and I had indicated, to to see that you know some people are going to be placed here to start to to watch the traffic as well um, because it's a very difficult difficult situation there which I don't think we're ever going to be able to clarify is it not being one but at least we can sort of control it and we need to start to the control there and um, as I indicated um, just this evening quick conversation with the captain in, in regards to making sure that is done um, as well and um, that whoever's placed there uh, can't have them there for 10 minutes or 20 minutes. They've got to stay there for a little bit longer, the more of a two or three hour type of a span. So um, I hope that we're, um, we're able to do that as, as well, whatever you can do with all the other streets. I realize that we're a population of 100,000 and there's traffic all over, the, all over the city. I mean, we can't conquer it all, but at least we're trying to do something. And uh, uh, you with the uh, traffic commission and uh, trying to even you know get together that we have some type of a, a division out there to do these things, I think is uh, most important. So I'm not on the traffic commission, but I'm following it. So uh, I'm going to coordinate, coordinate this with Sergeant Reardon. Yeah, great, great. I appreciate it. appreciate all this being done, too. Thank you, Captain. All set, Council? I am. Thank you, Council Fawa. Yeah, followed Madam, by Council Lally. Madam Chair and colleagues, uh, the state has some pretty tight requirements. There has there you must have three contacts with motorists per officer per hour in this grant, and there is also a requirement for an activity report to be generated. So if we fail to do that, they can actually withhold the funding. So I'm, I'm pretty satisfied that there are a lot of built-in safeguards here. Thank you. Thank you, Council Council Lally. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, no, Captain Halsey, I just wanted to, you know, thank you for coming out, and I just wanted to echo, you know, what my colleagues have said about the importance of this. Uh, I think I can speak for every member of the council when I say, you know, calls about people speeding or driving recklessly or, you know, a lot of accidents is something that, uh, you know, we get a lot of. So, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. You know, more money for, for this kind of coverage means that it, it helps everywhere in the city. Uh, you know, and I really do... I really do think that this, as, as it has been before, is, is going to be very helpful. So I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. All set, councillors? Yes. I'll entertain a motion. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. A motion has been made and properly seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carries favorably back to the full city council. Thank you. Madam Clerk, number three. Ordered acceptance and expenditure of the grant award in the amount of $300,000 from Department of Public Health Bureau of Addiction Services Substance Abuse Prevention Program, SAPC grant to 
Brockton Mayor's Office Substance Abuse Prevention Program, SAPC Grant Fund, invited Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Corin Capiello, Director of Social Services. Good evening, evening Councillors. I do have uh, my team member, Corin Capiello, here, who is truly the expert, but just to give you a quick synopsis on this and those that have been on the Council for a while, this, again, is just an aggressive and ongoing effort by the Mayor, Mayor's Office in the City to address addiction. And um, Corin can, can elaborate further, but um, it's, it's some money that's used wisely, uh, it's used effectively, and uh, it, it's, it's dire right now. People are dying. So with that being said, if anybody has any specific questions for Corin. So I'll just give a brief synopsis, counselors. Good evening. Um, this is $300,000 through June 2022, um, and we've been working with our grant manager. This is for um, overdose prevention only. So what we're going to be doing is in the next few months, we're going to be working with an evaluator. This isn't just for Brockton. So what we're going to be doing is um, working with an evaluator to pull um, the data, and we're going to be working with restaurants and places like Dunkin' Donuts and places like that that have high overdose rates. Um, and then we're going to be working with them on putting some policies and trainings in place, working with them to get Narcan and um, things like that. Councilor Cruz. Thank you. Actually, uh, just, uh, and it has been a great program and you do great work. But a quick question on how the reporting and how the money is used, because I do notice that it is a regional, East Bridgewater, Whitman, Hanson, and Rockland are involved too. Is this amount of money just used in Brockton or could it be used in any of the region? of those towns that are part of the grant? No, so how it works um, for the money through June at least, um, we're partnering with the Brockton Area Prevention Collaborative. Um, they receive funding from multiple sources. Um, so it goes to them and I work closely with them on that. So a majority of this funding is actually for salaries. Um, salaries and then supplies for things like um, creating brochures and policy work and things like that. Um, so, but it is for, so this particular money I wanna say, it's not necessarily for all those communities. So we've talked to our grant manager, it's gonna be based on what the data says. So it could be Avon this time. Um, so it, it's all gonna depend on what the data comes up with for this. But we do the reporting and the, uh, we handle the grant through Brockton. So the grant comes to the city, so in the past, like what's been happening is the grant, the grant money comes to the city and then we give it to High Point. High Point manages the collaborative. Okay. Their prevention services. Okay, that's, I just want to understand how it works. I mean, certainly a regional problem, so it's, yep. uh, I get that. But Yeah, the state's going, has been going in the regional way and sees Brockton as a mentor, so. Okay, and there's no, no match of any kind no, for this? No, no match. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Councilor Chairman. Councilor Ianieri, followed by Councilor McCaskill. Yeah, just, just briefly, Madam Chairman, I, I just want to take time to thank Corin Capiello for all that she's <coughs> done with this program, because I know she's worked hard um, with it. Uh, I think uh, you started under the, the Belzotti administration through Mayor Kapner's administration. I'm pleased to see that you know Mayor Sullivan sees the importance in this as well and wants to make sure that somebody like you is staying on to, to work this. And I, I think it's most important. You do a great job, and I hear nothing but great great comments out there about this whole program. So good luck. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilor Castro. Thank you. Good evening, Corin. And you do do a good job. Thank you. I was just had, as an aside, I was wondering, I understood that High Point had closed? Um, so the Castle, which is the adolescent program in Brockton, and their um, a psych program in Middleborough has closed. Their prevention program um, and their uh, detox, all their detox programs in Brockton are still open. And are they located in the next building from the Castle? In the same area, Meadowbrook? Yes, so they're at, they have 10 Meadowbrook Road is their uh, community detox, and 30 Meadowbrook Road is a Section 35 program for men. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Council Thompson. Hi, um, Corin, how are you tonight? Hi, good, how are you? I'm well, uh, thank you for being here. Just a quick question, so uh, you said that part of this grant's gonna be used to develop that strategic plan. Um, for for the region mm -hmm. um, in the next we, few months. Oh, so yeah, that kind of goes to my question. Mm -hmm. So do we do we know um, when that's is there a date on when that strategic plan would be complete and when um, that plan would be implemented? Uh, it'll be implemented ju by July first. Uh, the planning process is you know for the next few months through June. 
until June, develop the plan, and mm -hmm. then come July, start implementing yes. it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Move for favorable recommendation. Second. A motion has been made and properly seconded. All those Thank in you. favor? Thank All those opposed? Thank you. Motion carries favorably back to the full city council. Thank you, Corwin. Good evening again, Mayor. Good evening. Madam Clerk, number four. Ordered acceptance and expenditure of the grant award in the amount of $13,780 from Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Public Safety, Fiscal Year 20, Student and Senior Awareness of Fire Education, SAFE grant, to City of Brockton Fire Department, Fiscal Year 20, Student Awareness of Fire Education, SAFE grant fund, $10,655 and two, City of Brockton Fire Department, Fiscal Year 20 Senior Safe Grant Fund, $3,125. No match required. Invited, Troy Clarkson, Chief Financial Officer, Michael Williams, Chief of Fire. Councilors, this is a grant through the uh, Commonwealth Safe Program. I know that um, the CFO, Mr. Clarkson, sent out a link um, which, which illustrated and, and gave information relative to the educational program. I know the fire chief is here. Mr. Clarkson, if there's any specific <laughs> questions relative to this. Move favorable. Second. A motion has been made and properly seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion carries favorably back to the full city council. Thank you. Thank Councils. you. Thank you. Madam Clerk, number five. Order. Regulations governing the operation of hawkers and peddlers within the city of Brockton. Councilor Fowler. Uh, Madam Chair and colleagues, uh, our Legislative Council has made repeated calls to the Division of Standards to evaluate whether we are compatible with state regulations for hawkers and peddlers. There's only one license in the city, so we're not exactly holding up a, a, uh, a number of people who want <coughs> these licenses. Because of the lack of response to our Legislative Council, I contacted Representative Jerry Cassidy and he is reaching out to the Division of Standards, and I do suspect that a state representative will have more of a, uh, more luck with this agency than we have had. So with that, I would like to ask that it be postponed again to the next FinCom meeting. So moved. Uh, on the motion. I just, uh, point of information uh, through you to Council Fowell. If there's only one person that has a license, do we know does the license remain active? Or are we putting that person out of business while we postpone? No, I, I, uh, to Actually, my colleague through the chair, my understanding is that person is licensed and operating under the regulations oh. that were adopted last year because they didn't have any end date. So all regulations are still in effect. That person has his license. And what I'm trying to do is just make sure that we are we're, we're comporting with state regulations here at the city level. For example, the state license is $62. We charge 360 and I'm sure not putting anybody out of business. Thank you. And, and I will follow up with the clerk. I didn't get a chance to do that today, but to make sure that we're not. No. So, um, again, move to postpone to the next FinCon. A motion has been made and properly seconded. <clears throat> yep. Yes. Seconded? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All those in favor to, uh, in postponing till the next uh, FinCon meeting? All those opposed? The matter is postponed until the next finance meeting. Madam Chair. Councillor Lally. Uh, I'd like to move that we take number seven out of order. Do we have a second? Okay, motion's been made to take number seven out of order. All those in favor of uh, taking number seven before number six? All those opposed? Okay, Madam Clerk, number seven. Resolve that the superintendent of schools appear before the city council to explain the impact of the Student Opportunity Act in the Brockton Public Schools. Invited Michael Thomas, superintendent, Brockton Public Schools. Good evening, superintendent. How are you this evening? Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, first good. of all, I'd like to um, recognize that we have our colleagues from the school committee here. Our vice chair, Mark D'Agostino, is here. Uh, uh, school committee member Judy Sullivan and school committee member Tony Rodriguez is here as well. So thank you for being here tonight. And we did take you out of order. That way you can give your spiel before the funding. Thank you, part. Council President. I appreciate that. Thank you. So uh, I'm happy to, to be here tonight to, um, to go over the new Student Opportunity Act that was uh, signed into law by Governor Baker back on November 26th. 
So this is supposed to make right the funding formula for Chapter 70 over the next seven years. There's still some questions out there whether uh, the way they're funding it in the first year, but I am happy to announce that um, for the foreseeable future that uh, the layoffs in the Brockton Public Schools are over. So that's the good news. So part of this new Student Opportunity Act, and I want to thank the mayor uh, and the chief of staff. I know she's been uh, forwarding some emails to you, um, some background information that I've been trying to pass along through the mayor's office to you. But this Student Opportunity Act, there's some people I need to thank. First, I need to thank this body for, uh, you did put money in the budget for the last three years towards a lawsuit um, that basically the pressure of that lawsuit did put the pressure on the state to do something and put this act in place. So I appreciate the support of, of this body as well as the school committee, super, former Superintendent Kathy Smith who, and Aldo who spent hours up on the hill um, advocating for this money. I want to thank Mike Brady, Claire Cronin, Jerry Cassidy, and Michelle Dubois for their hard work on the Hill that actually helped push to get this law inactive. So the 80% of this new money is going to 35 districts across the Commonwealth, and we're one of those. I'll have Aldo come up in a few minutes and actually go over the numbers uh, and give you a synopsis of where we are with, with funding. But along with this money, it comes with a three-year um, plan that has to be submitted to the Department of Education by April 1st. And part of that plan is it's incumbent upon me, the superintendent, to engage all stakeholders. That's people that work in the district, that's you as elected officials, that's parents, uh, bilingual parents, uh, special ed uh, uh, parents, parents of all students in the Brockton Public Schools. So I'll be holding forums for parents, I'll be ho holding for forums for staff, forums for uh, teachers, and all other staff members to get their input on uh, our three-year plan. So I have to engage all stakeholders. So basically this money needs to be used for evidence-based programs laid out by the Department of Education meaning that we have to show we're spending this money wisely and it's going towards the most deserving kids, kids that are struggling, uh, special education students, our English language learners, students who are scoring in the lowest 25%. Those are the programs they want you to focus on. Uh, and I, I gave you, a, um, it's a three page, it's kind of a highlighted synopsis of the Student Opportunity Act. It really explains it well. It was put out by the, um, by the Mass Association of um, <coughs> Superintendents, and it just lays out a lot of the highlights of the, um, of the law. But what I'll, I'll point towards is the evidence-based programs that the Department of Ed really wants you to uh, focus your money on, and that's um, enhanced core instruction, target student supports, meaning that core instruction is you need to lower class size. And as you know, as we've been laying teachers off the last eight years, we need to make sure we lower class size. So, the first goal of this money is to make sure we hire staff. That's teachers, that's paras, that's MTAs, and we focus on the classroom to bring class size down. We also have to make sure we, we have targeted student supports. That's adjustment counselors. Uh, students getting the supports that they need as far as their social and emotional learning. We do not have enough adjustment counselors in, you know, in, the, in our schools. There are five at Brockton High for 4,200 students. That's an example how short we are with, with our adjustment counselors. That's focusing on extra help for our special education students and our English language learners. That's expanding our pre-K programs. Um, they're looking for us to expand pre-K, not only half-day pre-K, but full-day pre-K. So there's several items that they list as the menu of items, dropout prevention is another one, intervention programs to reduce suspension rates, programs to in, enhance attendance if students are missing a lot of school. So there's several items in here that we'll be focusing on, we'll be presenting to our staff, we'll be presenting to our parents, uh, obviously here tonight. I'm welcome to come back as we go through this and I'll definitely come back before April 1st to go over the plan with you. So the s school committee has to approve our three-year plan before it gets submitted to the state. And in that plan, you have to actually go over all the stakeholder meetings that you've had, this being one of them. Um, but obviously, we'll come back before the plan's submitted. But I'm happy to, I'm gonna have Al come up and go over the actual budget numbers, and then I'll, I'll stay and answer any questions, obviously. Quick question, is this on the school, um, on the school website? Yes, the school website? So, so we posted, 
Um, all the materials about the Student Opportunity Act and a new bubble on the website two, two weeks ago. We sent a text message out to all uh, staff and our, our students, letting them know, I mean, our, our parents letting them know that it's on our website and they all have been translated as well. Thank and we'll continue much. to update the website as, as needed. Thank you. Good evening, Aldo. Good evening, counselors. Um, so we passed out to you a little sheet that says preliminary, um, FY21 preliminary budget summation. So this is off the governor's budget. As you all know, there'll be a House budget, there'll be a Senate budget, then there'll finally be a compromise. But in order to build our budget, we build off of um, the governor's because it's a while before we get the rest of our um, other budgets. So basically, as you can see, what, we, what you read in the headlines, what you saw was that Chapter 70 went up 21 million. So what you have to drill down to is out of that Chapter 70, we have students that have gone to charter schools and students that have gone to choice schools. Um, we lose you know, funding for those students when they go. And if we take any in, we get some money reimbursed. Charter school, we don't take any kids in, but the state gives us a, re a reimbursement for each child that leaves. Now, for the past almost 10 years, we've never seen a reimbursement for the second or third year. We've received some reimbursement for the first year. In the Student Opportunity Act, they're now saying that they're going to fund all three years of reimbursement. So we see a pretty good increase um, to $2.5 million coming back. But we have $4 million going out to charters. So that brings us this year to a total of $20 million going out to charter schools. We have over 1,000 students that go out. And when they go out, they take our per pupil allotment. So, uh, and school choice is much smaller numbers, but it's, um, it's a lot better for us because we don't lose all of our funding with those. They, only, they receive $5,000 per student they take, and we receive 5000 for any student we take in. So that works out. You get to keep the rest of your chapter 70. So that works out a lot better for us than the charters do. Um, as you know, we have one charter in Brockton, but um, they have a certain number of seats, but they've also, the past few years, increased the number of seats in the Foxborough Charter and in the South Shore Charter School. Um, as they increase seats, we lose more students to those schools. So that nets out to 19.8 million of new <coughs> funding coming in this year. Um, and then below that is what I took out what we know for our expenses. Number one is they gave us a grant this past year for $2.5 million, 2.47. Uh, that grant is gone next year. So right away that comes off the top. We have our contractual raises, our contractual step increases to all the unions. Um, we have our um, ordinary maintenance, we have contracts for you know, trash pickup, for electricity, for um, other services that we have, our copy machines and whatnot. So there's slight increases in there. Last year we prepaid a little over a million dollars in special education tuitions to out of district schools, which are allowed to by law. Um, we also um, bought our, you know, our paper and our chemical supplies. So that number needs to go back in the cover for this year since the end of this year, I don't, I don't expect really any extra funds to do any of that with next year. And a couple I've left as zeros because we don't know them yet. One is we don't know if we're gonna lose any other grants. So I always have a placeholder. In case we lose a grant, we have to either make up the money or cut the personnel or the, the supplies. And the other is our health insurance costs. In the coming weeks, I'll be speaking to the, uh, the CFO, um, Troy Clarkson, to discuss what our health insurance is gonna look like for next year, and then we budget a figure for that amount, and that's how we determine where we end up. So at this point, roughly from the governor's budget, I'm predicting about 7.8 million of what I call discretionary spending to do these programs that the superintendent outlined to you, with the hopes that maybe the House returns more money to us, or the House and Senate send us more money. Any additional funding they send to us, of course, we'll um, put to use and we'll follow the guides of the Student Opportunity Act to help rebuild our school system. Thank you. Sure. So in the coming, obviously in the coming <coughs> month, there'll be several school committee meetings as well. We start with a retreat this Saturday, actually next Saturday, the 29th, and that's gonna a lot focus on the budget and focus on how we're gonna build the budget focused on the Student Opportunity Act and the evidence-based programs. But obviously that's first and foremost, getting teachers back in the classroom, getting paras back. Um, about two years ago, uh, we cut a lot of paras, so not every kindergarten class has a full-time para anymore, and that's something that has been desperately missing. So uh, obviously that's something we're looking to bring back. So obviously it's, the things that are coming back first, first are what supports the classroom, number one. 
and that's obviously has always been the school committee's uh, goal. Um, they're going to go through. We have a budget barometer that we've been using for the last seven years. has everything we cut every year, so the school committee will go through every line item on that list and see what we can bring back for programs, but obviously we have to focus on the classroom first. I think that's great. That's really important that our kids come first. Councilors, any questions for the superintendent or Aldo? Councilor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, just a quick question. Did we get any additional funding or any funding at all for non-net non school spending? Uh, no. Uh, other than, Aldo, there's some circuit breaker money, the correct? That might help. There's some circuit breaker money that helps with special ed out of district uh, transportation. Um, we, have, we don't know that yet. But unfortunately, that's not a real big area where the state helps us, is, is in, especially the transportation. So technically, out of this funding, we can't use that for transportation at all, any, any, of, any of that money? No. So that has to come from the city side of things? A absolutely, yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Councilor Lally. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to say one quick thing. I was very happy to hear um, that you're working on, you know, bringing the paraprofessionals back as well as everything else. But uh, when I was in, you know, I was a little surprised to hear that, you know, they aren't in every kindergarten class full time. So that's, that's very good to hear they're coming back. When I was in kindergarten, um, my teacher was out a lot uh, due to surgeries. We had a couple of long-term substitutes. So it was the paraprofessional that was that uh, source of, of constant uh, that we had, you know, they, they were, they really stepped up and, and fulfilled a larger role. So, you know, I think this is, this is phenomenal because we don't know what, uh, you know, what a kid might miss and that having that, that help, that constant is, is very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Council Powell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, we, we had an accounts committee meeting this evening and I was struck by the amount that we're spending for transportation in particular I think it's the McKinney Vento federal regulation and it was explained to us that you could have someone with a single vehicle transport a student it's two hundred and seventy dollars and then if someone else is transported that same day it's another two hundred and seventy and then if there's an afternoon trip it's another two hundred and seventy and that's eight hundred and ten dollars in one day just to transport three children. And uh, I don't know how school districts do it. I yeah. mean, it, it really erodes the amount of resources that are available for so many things. So hopefully you and the school committee will wrestle with some options. Uh, we, need to, we need to comply with the federal law, but I hope we could do it in a less onerous financial way uh, and, and recoup some of those revenues, or some of those funds to uh, use them in some other area. Well, I appreciate you bringing this up, Councillor, because uh, transportation costs, they're out of control. Um, and we've been working, uh, the school committee um, brought this up last year because um, they obviously look at the accounts as well. Um, and the transportation is now, for example, and, and I'll explain, we'll be coming to you because uh, we've been working with the school committee and we've been working with the mayor's office. So we would like to bring transportation in house you know, phase it in over time. So I'll give you a quick example. For a student, we went back 10 years ago, what we were spending on a, a they call them a minivan. So we were spending about $43,000 a year 10 years ago for one van, probably about 45,000 for a large bus. So we have about 104 of those. That's just with first student's contract. So coming up in <coughs> FY21, that same van is gonna cost us $84,000 and a bus will cost us about $86,000. So the costs are out of control. Um, the school committee um, down at the Mass Association of School Committee Conference, we went to a session of transportation and we heard districts who have brought transportation in house and how much money they're saving because they're basically the transportation companies, especially the large ones kind of have, we only get one bid. So I've been at central office for 10 years and we've put three bids out for the large you know, buses in, in the vans that first student have the 105 of them. And in those three bids, we get one bid and that's always first student. So um, you're right, the cost, not only for the in, the in uh, city transportation, but the out of district transportation for one child to go to an out of district school, uh, they're out of control. 
So we, we have come up with a plan to move forward. I've been working closely with Mayor Sullivan in the school committee, uh, and actually I submitted a letter to the, ma to the mayor to, bring, to be brought, brought before you to start bringing our transportation in-house because you make a great point. It's, it's, it's astronomical, and it's basically it's going to, there's no way we can keep this going forward and, and, and provide the transportation service we're providing now. There's no way to maintain it. Well, and not to pick on first student because it could be any company, but basically they've got a monopoly. Absolutely. They know that we can't exist without them, so they basically have an open checkbook and this is what we want, give it to us or else. Absolutely. And, uh, that, that, that's a very uncomfortable position to be in. And yes. so I, I'm glad that you're all working on some options because Lord knows where it will be five years from now. Council, just point of information. So we have one year remaining under the current um, agreement, contractual agreement. It's a three-year term. Uh, what the superintendent said, uh, I did file it with the clerk's office. Uh, we want to do it in phases over 10 years, 10 to 11 years. That way we can bring in 100% in uh, and we can control our own cost containment measures that way because exactly what, what Mike just said, you know, multiple trips each time, it's, it's a dollar amount. If we wanted uh, the Brockton High football team to go to an away game or the band or the drama festival in Boston or, uh, or a field trip, those are reoccurring costs and they keep adding up. We're going to be able to control our own destiny, but we will be presenting it before the entire body. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilors. Any other questions? I entertain a motion. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. A motion has been made and properly seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion carries favorably back to the full city council. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Mayor, and um, Aldo as well for speaking on this item. Mm. Uh, you might as well stay there because yeah. number six. Uh, Madam Clerk, number six. Ordered that the city council authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated April 3rd, 2020 for the Brockton High School located at 470 Forest Avenue, Brockton, Mass which describes the deficiencies and the priority categories as delineated on the addendum for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. Brockton High School full renovation and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting the statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or approval of the application the award of a grant or any other funding commit commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority or commits the City of Brockton to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Invited, Michael Thomas, Superintendent Brockton Public Schools, Aldo Petronio, Chief Financial Officer. Good evening again. Thank you, Council President. Um, this is an application. This is the first of a long process with the MSBA. Um, and this is an application for the renovation of Brockton High School. As you know, Brockton High School opened in 1970. It's 50 years old, and it has served us very well. Uh, it pretty much runs 24-7, um, but is in desperate need of renovation. So this is just um, permission. Uh, the school committee had to take a vote. Now the city council is just basically asking you permission for me to be able to uh, submit an application to the MSBA and after that just the application would go out in just a quick timeline they take all the applications for what they call the core program it's either for a renovation or a new school obviously we will apply for a renovation um, they come out in November they'll come out in November of 2020 they actually They'll do a tour of the building, um, several officials from the MSBA, and they let you know about a week before uh, Christmas whether you're accepted into the core program. Then if you're accepted in the pro core program, then we would come back here uh, and they would ask you to then um, accept the invitation and then enter into the feasibility stage where that you would actually, then we would have to get an architect on board that they assign, um, and obviously that's when you'd have to vote on the amount that we would pay an architect to basically evaluate the whole building and basically put a price tag on what it would cost. And then from there, that would be probably another year that they would study Brockton High and actually put a feasibility study together and, and let us know what the actual cost would be. Um, there's a lot of input from the city council, from the school committee, from stakeholders, parents, Throughout that year, they have several meetings. There's committees set up of the school committee and joint committees of the city council. 
it's a long planning year and at the end of that they come up with a price tag and then obviously we'd have to come for another vote to you know come for funding and as we get 80 percent funding so a renovation project at this size it's probably from this point today if this was all to go through and we were able to fund it and we got accepted the ribbon cutting would probably be somewhere 2028 2029 that's how long of a process this is with the um with the msba and obviously brockton high school being the largest high school in the state um it's just a, it's a very long process and this is step one there you go very good and you did supply us with uh, some, a little bit of a timeline this evening madam chairman just uh, just to refresh the counselors that have been on the uh, committee for a while uh when we were remote because the elevator was broken we had the unknown school and the superintendent <laughs> at that time as the assistant superintendent shared that information at that time it would be done over phases and over time um, tonight is just step one doesn't create any financial or legal obligation for the city of Brockton but it is a requirement school committee already did it and thank you very much this is step one on the city council level and then we'll work collectively to see what best practice going forward thank you um, so council Lally all right oh geez uh, that's close. 10 years down the road if I'm around then I'd, I'd like you to invite me I uh, I went to the huh? I went to the Brookfield for elementary school and it was it was built in the early 60s and I thought that was I thought that was pretty old but people have told me that the mid 60s is not old <laughs> not old um, I, I do have a couple of questions I think this is I think this is great I think that you know it's it's the, it's a good time to you know reinvest I should say in the high school and, and really uh, grow it as, as we've grown um, I do have a question it's not entirely related uh, but it's about another building, the uh, the administration building, you know, right right over there. Uh, it's a it's an old building. It's historic. It's a it's a great building. Uh, is there any money going to going towards that? Are, are we getting any money to uh, to you know spruce it up? Yes. Yeah, so um, Jerry Cassidy got uh, we got a grant last year from um, uh, um, Representative Cassidy's office, and he ended up getting us enough money so we could buy an 80 foot boom, a lift. Oh, wow. to be able to get up so this spring we'll be up there we'll be painting the dome scraping down the old paint that's you know obviously chipped off and repainting um, we're going to do as much as we can do in-house with our with our carpenters and, and painters without breaking any laws as far as because it is an historic building so we um, unless it's something considered like um, about three years ago we had to do something with the snow fence around so we actually got clearance to be able to do that emergency work other than that you really can do very little structural work with a historic building but we will be doing maintenance to make it look a lot better because it is an eyesore um, every time I'm in the men's room on on this floor and I look out and you know it, it is an eyesore no question about it so we will be doing painting and I think um, Jerry Cassidy for getting us that money and we're hoping he's actually looking to get us some money in this um, next budget as well so we can do some other work to that building oh, fantastic yeah and I uh, I, pre I appreciate the heads up it's a timely yeah. question I don't know if, if you uh, if you have me bugged or not but I uh, I was walking over today with Troy Clarkson and Aldo Petronio and Megan Bridges and I said it looks like hell it looks oh like God. hell um, and, and the boom that, that Representative Cassidy was able to acquire for us doesn't necessarily reach the height that we need to do the Golden Dome. Uh, but we are, I rest assured, uh, as long as I'm mayor, we're going to clean up because perception's reality. To the point where I asked the superintendent in the springtime, the actual flagpole doesn't look good as, as well. So the little things add up. So oh, yeah. good question. And uh, just ask that to you today, Aldo. Thank you. I don't have you bugged, Mr. Mayor, but I do agree. I, I, do, I do agree it was pretty cold this afternoon. Um, no, uh, no, I think that's fantastic, and I think the uh, the work to the high school is fantastic as well. Thank you, thank, thank you, Madam you. Chair. Also, Councilor yep. Council Thompson had his <coughs> hand up earlier. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, appearing tonight, Mr. Superintendent. You're you're always a wealth of information, oh, no and it's thank always uh, much appreciated. Uh, quick question: Is is this the first SOI that uh, that the city has submitted uh, for renovation of Brockton High? Yes. It is. Yeah, actually, no. I um, for renovation, yes. Um, about nine years ago, I submitted one for a new roof uh, and windows. Um, so back in 2010, 
we submitted an application, um, and it's called the accelerated repair. They used to call it the green repair, and that's for roof, windows, and boilers. So we did one for the high school and several other schools back then. So back, it, it ended up being 2012 when they did the work. So they, we do, the high school does have new windows, and the four academic buildings and the core building um, have a new roof back in 2012. So that was on the accelerated repair. Okay. Uh, this is the, the core renovation. This is the first one, yes. Okay, great. Um, so, again, you're asking for a full uh, renovation. That's the electric, the heating, ventilation, bathrooms, all the technology. And you said to update the building um, to make them uh, be in line with building codes and fire codes. Um, I know you said that the, the cost of this whole thing will be determined later, you know, down the road. Would you feel comfortable today at all uh, making a ballpark figure on what that number would be? If I had a guess, um, a, a renovation would be probably about $200 million. If they come to you and say, after the feasibility study, it, it might be wise to put a STEM wing to add a building onto the high school to, for technology and STEM. Yes. It could go to 250 to 300 million, and it's again, it's hard to put a price tag. That's my best guess, and I'm far from an architect. Um, but um, you're looking at sprinkler system, all new. I mean, there's only two elevators in the whole school, um, all ADA compliance. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot of work that has to go into it. Um, so, I would guess anywhere from 200 to 300 million dollars. And, and uh, Brockton, the city's portion of that would be 20%. 20%, correct. Well, I appreciate you, um, um, you know, uh, uh, providing that number to us. Um, and uh, also, uh, thank you for providing uh, this uh, proposed timeline. I think you answered half of my questions just by uh, proposing the timeline. So it's, um, I, I do appreciate that. And I have no further questions, ma uh, Madam President. Councilor, Councilor uh, Cruz followed by Councilor Castro. Thank you. So we are talking about the new Brockton High School. Yes. <laughs> I mean, a lot of it should still be in good shape. I didn't use the library at all. I didn't use the, but um, actually uh, a little bit of the question has already come up. The idea of a, a STEM addition, would that be considered part of the renovation? Or would yes. The, so it would be part of They yes. would consider that part of the renovation. Yes. And you... you what, what do you see in the future as far as student population? Will we be working out of three buildings while we renovate one of the time? Is that how you generally um, think we I would do that? We would stay right. We've been flat at the high school with about 41 to 4,200 students for the last, I'd say, the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. So I see that staying pretty much steady. Um, so we could work. Um, they, again, they could come and say, you should build a STEM wing first and then you'll have more <coughs> swing space to move students into um, that building and the other three Why we take down, you know, the Azure and renovate it, then the yellow and so forth. Exactly right. And when you say take down, you mean take offline? Take offline. Yeah, exactly. Not take, but, you know, basically take offline, you know, gut the inside. Obviously, there's asbestos abatement that needs to be done. Um, all, obviously, all the HVAC system needs to be changed. The electrical all needs to be done over, plum you know, plumbing. Um, but again, that, they would take it offline and kind of do it in a phased renovation. And then both end buildings really need work too, don't they? Absolutely, yeah. You see that the, um, um, even though, the, you know, people think that's the fine ass roof, that's the, the, they're causing the problem with the water that's coming in, it's actually the walls. So if you look at the fine arts building, you have the high walls, that, mm -hmm. that's actually the auditorium. Right. Um, so that brick now is so porous and we've had water, we've waterproofed it, we've tried Thompson's water seal, we tried everything under the sun to yeah. try to stop the water from coming in, but if you get a wind-driven rain, it comes right through that right brick through like a sponge, and then you can see it, if you've been up there for meetings, there's buckets along the hallways. Uh, that's actually not from the oh, roof. I thought that was an art project. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so basically you're right, they would have to spend time doing the fine arts, doing the, um, doing the gym over, um, they don't do, they don't give you money for swimming pools anymore, indoor swimming pools, so that would actually have to be an expense that we, you know, if there was any work to be done to the swimming pool. That well, if those be. walls are leaking, it doesn't matter, they yeah. swim the pool. So. <laughs> so. Because that is a, I mean, it's, the public needs to know, I mean, obviously this is something we know we have to move forward on. 
but it's going to be a tough 10 years or so while we do that because renovation work is really tough in, a, in an existing school and a school like Absolutely. that over 10 years or so is going to be you'll be glad you'll be gone by then <laughs> and, and like you said the point is that you, as, you, as you look at all this, the towns around us have built all new schools east bridge water west bridge the ones that were jealous and, of us exactly, 50 they years put, ago they they keep the kid you know they keep the students in the old school as they build the new school either out back or out front right you know we don't have that option of right. of a school our size so uh, a renovation a phased renovation is really the only option we have and just so the public knows Durfee High School, they just built a new school, correct? Yeah, they're, they're probably a year away from uh, And the, how the old was the school they just moved out of? Are they moving out of? That was opened in 72. 72, so basically the same age. Same age as, as what we're talking about, and they're already building a new school. So yep. just so the public's aware of that, that 50 years, it's really, it's done a great job for the city. It's been Absolutely. A, it's been a phenomenal place, but it's it's tired. Yes. So. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Council Councilor Castro. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Thomas. Good Thank evening. you for being here. I reviewed the materials and I appreciate the opportunity to familiarize myself. I speaking for my colleagues, we all want to be on board on this and be aware. I just had a question. There was a sentence that caught my eye on the first page of the uh, the, the page entitled 2019 core program statement of interest process overview. Under the section marked the statement of interest filing period, there's a sentence in here that says, a statement of interest should only be filed by a facility where a district has the ability to fund a project in the next two years. And I'm just wondering, how did you all reach the conclusion that it was time and we could do this in the next two years? Um, I, basically, that's the language they put in. Yes. Um, but this this vote is allowing me to submit the application. Yes. But if they accept us, mm -hmm. we would have to come back to you, and they would then then we would have to make a commitment that the funding would have to be it would be a two year funding process. Mm -hmm. I can let I don't know if Troy, if you want, or Aldo can come up, but um, that's if we're accepted in. Mm -hmm. And we agree to go to the do the feasibility study. Yes. That's when we'd have to really take on the money pot. Yes, absolutely. But it's there now, and that's why I thought I I should inquire. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's part of the MSBA has um, the way that they word it and the way they make sure they protect themselves so they don't paint themselves into a corner. Meaning that once you vote to let me submit an application, in the past because a lot of towns they go to the obviously they do the town meetings mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of confusion confusion that if you vote to allow an application to go through that you're voting for funding at this at this phase which is not the case okay but they do protect really protect themselves with a lot of language in their in yeah. their motions it sounds like they want a clear yeah. ex expression absolutely. of intent absolutely. and a time period on it too absolutely so okay. we would again if we get accepted in december um they would we would come back to you probably the it would be january um of 2021 mm -hmm. um we would come back to you with with basically they accepted us in and then obviously troy the mayor's office and we'd have to work on how we would pre present the funding for obviously you know we're on the hook for 20 percent of that right. and that's obviously capital money which is the city's that's right. obligation so mm -hmm. there'd have to be a lot of vetting and I think the good thing about the MSBA is that um, they really make you do your due, due diligence when you're doing this like mm -hmm. there would have to be a joint committee of the school committee and the City Council mm -hmm. um, to go through the whole feasibility part um, to make sure you get exactly what we're asking for and even after that's done you can still say we can't do this we can't fund it we have to you know, we've done the feasibility. We know what the price tag is, but we have to, we have to pull out, and that's happened f with other districts before. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want. To. Not happened here. Just on that question, most um, most schools that are built in the state, um, most high schools, as a matter of fact, are smaller than some of our elementary schools. So when they put that two-year window in there, what they're basically are saying is build it in the parking lot, fresh, brand new, quick and easy, basically then we'll tear down the old school. We don't have that luxury. So for us doing a, re a remodel, basically, 
is why it, we're, we're ready to go in two years, but when we say ready to go, that means we're ready to start um, small. And that's why it would take many years uh, spreading it out, because there's no way we can build a school um, without affecting the students that are there. We don't have room on either side of the high school to do anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that's why um, okay. they, they look for that project. Most schools that are built are, uh, again, a 500, 700 person school, whereas ours is 4,100. Thank you. They're very user friendly. So obviously as we go through this process, I could actually have um, one of the um, assistant executive directors come before you and answer any questions because I think we would be a special project. I think they've expected us to put in for the renovation of Brockton High now for probably quite some time because every time I'm at a meeting at the MSPA, they say, when you, when, when's the high school coming? And mm -hmm. so I think they've kind of been bracing themselves for this to come forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they know that if, you know, if we were accept accepted, then they would pretty much have to change like that two year, how, how they conduct business as far as the funding because we're a, pretty much a different, we're different from like Aldo said, the smaller schools that this is different a lot animal. different process. Yes. So, but you know, they're really helpful. They're actually one of the, they're one of the best state agencies to deal with. Um, you always get somebody on the phone. Um, they always answer your questions, and I'd be happy to bring someone in front of this um, this body to answer any questions as well. Thank you. Just to follow up on what the superintendent and, and Aldo said. I think it's important uh, that the council and the general public know that despite the fact that the actual funding request for this project is sometime in the future, we are already at work uh, as a team planning uh, for the potential funding of this project. Because as you know, uh, the funding of this project doesn't occur in a vacuum that you, you read about and you hear about other capital projects that are ongoing, including a public safety complex. And so the kind of numbers that we're talking about are daunting. Uh, so we are developing a plan uh, to manage our debt effectively over the next decade so that when the bill for these projects come due, it will be at a minimal expense to the taxpayers. Uh, and, and we mean that, I mean that sincerely. So. Uh, I discuss this with the mayor on a regular basis. Uh, the planning began uh, when, when Councilor Rodriguez was, was mayor and have frequent conversations uh, several times a week with, with Aldo uh, and the four of us meet as a team on a regular basis. So it's just important that you know that although this first step is planning, uh, we are aware of the financial impact uh, and, and are working hard to, to make it affordable. Thank you. I, I'm sure I speak for all of us. We do want to see this happen. It must happen. Our children deserve the best. Thank you. All set, Thank you. Councilor. Thank Councilor Yanieri. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> first off, I think we'd we'd all be foolish if we weren't uh, standing behind this uh, uh, proposal before us because it, it's only in the best interest, as Councilor Nacasso just said, it's in the best interest of the the children of this city and. Um, one who spent, I was there for 20 years on the school committee and, uh, and, and saw a lot be done. And uh, I think um, the right here, it, it, it's time for this one. Just as Councilor Cruz mentioned, I mean, the, the building is tired. I graduated there in the class of 1972. That was then, that was the most modernist building uh, fourth of the Mississippi, to be truthful with you, when I graduated, when I went to school there. So um, now we're, we're in a different type of a situation. Um, but we have to be doing. Um, we have to. We have to be following this through. And I'm, I'm happy to hear from the chief financial <coughs> officer say we got to. Uh, we're developing a plan because you have to keep that plan going. Names and faces are going to change, and that's true. They will change no matter what. We'll all be doing something different at some point. But we need to make that that happen. It, this this thing has to happen. Uh, I just want to get off track, not off track from some something I want to ask the superintendent regarding. Um, school, if I might, Madam Chair, um, and I know uh, Council Alley mentioned the uh, Crosby building in the, in the the Gold Dome and and the um, naturally the railings that are around up on that building there because it's um it's a great piece of architecture that was there for those that don't know that that haven't lived in Brockton that long that that was the United States Post Office here for the city of Brockton. And I can still see this day going in the front door as I used to go down by your office 
Mr. Superintendent, and uh, and when Mad George had his office, the safe is still there, if I'm not mistaken. But oh, yeah. you could still see where the tellers were lined right up, and where your office is now was just a wooden door kept shut all the time because that's where the main man sat right in there. So, um, not to speak old times, but um, I'm happy to hear that we're going to be able to do something with that because. Um, it always looked great when it was lit. When I was on the school committee, we had to do it over once, and it was lit, and the flagpole was was um, sparkling. And if you're going to do the flagpole, I want that same green and that same white because that's what's been on that flagpole for Absolutely. for many, 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 many years. But I want to jump for one second um, because I know we, we, we're going to be starting to do something soon, I hope, and that's the Huntington School Roof. Yes. Where are we at with that? Because I know we, we went through so, a lot to um, get that done too. The contract um, is at, is in the uh, law office for the um, the architect and the OPM. Good. So that should be coming out of the law office actually pretty soon. Okay. So um, then a bid, the bid package will go out for the roof. Um, and we'll see what we get for bids, and um, we're hoping that we're, best case scenario, obviously, that we get bids and we start pretty probably into July. Um, really if good. there's obviously any delays, it will push it into, you know, August or, or September. Um, they'll they'll price out different roofs. They'll price out um, redoing the slate that's there, which you know we'll have to see how that goes. Um, there'll be a metal option as well, but also would have to fit the age of the building so it fits in and looks like it's been there. Uh, and they also give you an option of um, shingles, which I'm not a huge fan of, but um, the metal or the slate are the two best options for the length and durabil durability of that building. But I'm hoping that that work would start sometime in July um, into August. And that's great. That's great. That to should hear. be, and they, that, that roof with the, it will be new gutters, um, new flashing. So, that's probably uh, probably a three month project. Right, that's that's great to hear. And yep. and because of that, that building has to remain to be used for educational purposes Absolutely. because of that that roof and that could still go on for some time within yes. that neighborhood. Yeah, they could do I that work with the, without closing. Okay, the school. great. I appreciate that. But I commend you, Mr. Superintendent, your staff, and the school committee members. Uh, you know, for diving into the situation that it's, it's time for us to do renovations at BHS, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm with it. So thank you. Good job, thanks. Councilors, again, I just wanted to uh, thank you uh, for the kind words tonight. And as you recall, at the inaugural address, when I stood up there, I said it was built in 70 the year I was born. And we know we have to invest money in our schools for the kids and for the teachers. Um, we are still one of the largest public high schools east of the Mississippi. Um, and we have to, you know, um, do a cost analysis. But this is step one. Um, the superintendent is still going to be here in 10 years. We're not going to let him leave, Councillor. Um, but you know what? We do have a good brain trust. We are crunching the numbers. The 200, 200 million is a huge number. That sounds scary. Um, but again, we're going we're to kind of vet it out. And the... Uh, you know, the return is going to worth the investment. So, again, I, I look forward to working with you in collaboration to achieve uh, what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Councilor Yanir, are you all set? I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Any other councilors that haven't asked any questions yet? Oh. Councilor Cruz. Just one last follow-up question. You did talk about <clears throat> the MSBA, and they have, I know they're one of the best agencies to work with out of the state, and we've been one of their best customers through the years. As I recall, um, We've been as high as 90 or 93 percent. Any chance they'll be looking to help us out anymore? Or? No, they, that was under when we did the desegregation um, of the district back in um, the early 90s. So that was part of that 90 part of the, percent. Part of the so they're, they're the largest they offer now is the 80, yeah, yeah. unfortunately. We'll have to see if we can find a new pr program with them. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Motion recommend favorably. Second. So um, we vote, Superintendent. I just want again want to thank you for um, it, the Student Opportunity Act would not have been signed into law if it wasn't for Brockton leading the charge. Uh, and I know Kathy before me was in front of you often, um, and you were always pushing, pushing the lawsuit, why we haven't filed it, pushing, pushing, and um, you know, and I really think that got it done with the state. I mean, I know there's other districts that were involved, Chelsea, Worcester, Fall River, and Taunton, but I think Brockton actually led the charge uh, like we did back in, you know, 1992 when the, when the first um, Ed Reform Act went in, and it was Brockton that led the charge then. So I want to thank the school committee, the mayor's office, and also the city council for always supporting the Brockton Public Schools, and also 
you know, our, um, our state reps who have really done a good job. And it's not easy up on the hill fighting because you have every other city in town fighting for funding as well. And, you know, for year after year, they stayed with us and really fought hard for this. And I really appreciate everybody's help. It's true. We thank you as well. Thank you. And thank you to the school committee. Uh, thank you for all you do. Thank you. A motion has been made and properly seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion carries favorably back to the full city council. Madam Clerk, number eight. Resolve, one, that the city of Brockton recognizes the importance of the 2020 census and supports participation in helping to ensure a complete, fair, and accurate count. Invited, Eva Ongrade, 2020 Census Outreach Coordinator. Pedro de Sous, 2020 Census Partnership Specialist. Good evening, Good evening. Madam Chairman. Um, Councilors, I just want to publicly thank uh, Councilor at Large and former Mayor Moises Rodriguez, who had the foresight to hire Eva. Um, we, we've said this since I've become mayor, and Moses and I share this belief. We only have one shot at this, so we have to wait 10 years. If we don't get it right, we're losing a ton of federal money. Um, I met last week in a roundtable with Pedro, who's here tonight, Ed Miller, uh, who's a Brockton resident who's working for the census, and of course, Eva, who works here at City Hall. Uh, she's paid out of the CFO's uh, uh, line item. Um, she is out of Cindy in the elections, and she's here to really maximize the return. She is going to all the places we need to go. Um, but we need everybody, all the elected officials, uh, all the clergy, all the business agencies, to really, really spread the word. Because if we don't get this, we are going to shortchange Brockton for another 10 years. With that being said, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Eva. Thank Good you evening. for being Thank here you. tonight. And I know you passed out a lot of these, um, you know, the little brochure to everybody, and um, that holds a lot of information. So, do you have something to say? Or do you just want to go into uh, questions? Um, from just the going now uh, after what um, uh, the mayor spoke already, the importance of the census, and that we only get a shot every ten years. Um, we need everyone's help, and we have an event coming up on the 26th of February at the War Memorial Building to increase the number of members of our Complete Count Committee that will help spread the word of the importance of the census in the city of Brockton. So um, an email was sent yesterday, and an event was created uh, just inviting every leader in the city and when I say leader, everyone is a leader, I believe. Um, so whenever we... Um, if you have received it already, please share it, and uh, just so it, that we can increase as many people as possible in that, uh, sharing the message to all Brockton residents. Perfect. Councillor um, Thompson, I know this was your resolve. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Ava, Pedro, uh, Raymond, Ed, uh, thank you all for appearing tonight. Um, Brockton's participation in the 2020 census is vitally important to our city. Uh, the federal government apportions approximately $675 billion a year uh, based upon population totals um, and further breakdowns by sex, age, race, and other factors. I'd like to address my fellow Brocktonians that by responding to the 2020 census, you ensure Brockton gets its fair share of these funds and that these funds go to support our schools, our hospitals, our roads, our public works, and other vital programs, uh, including four uh, which were before the council tonight. So um, Ava, Pedro, Raymond, Ed, um, <clears throat> my question is, uh, can you inform the council uh, what efforts are currently underway to ensure a complete, fair, and uh, accurate count of Brockton residents? Good evening. I'm sorry, just state your name because sure. we don't have you as an invited guest. Yep. Raymond Bennett. I'm a senior partnership specialist with the U.S. Census Bureau. Okay, thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Raymond, any objections? To, uh, I know Raymond is an invited guest. I'm sorry for that, but no um, please. If thank you. you. So I just want to start by saying, um, you know, our goal in a, a true successful census will be counting everybody once, only once, and in the right place. And for the city of Brockton, uh, we're gonna take a huge step toward that goal next week when we do our census solutions workshop, where as Iva said, we bring in um, 
community leaders to have a conversation about the very real challenges that Brockton faces, the impediments that might exist toward a complete and accurate count here in Brockton, and we talk about what solutions we can come up with to overcome those obstacles. Uh, my colleague Pedro has been doing a lot of work in the city of Brockton um, to sort of lay the groundwork with a lot of nonprofit organizations, the school department, um, working with the mayor's office we met uh, at the beginning of February uh, to really get things started here in the city. Um, and our goal is, again, to count everybody once, only once, and in the right place. Pedro, do you want to talk about yes. specifics? Thank you, Madam President. So I'll be, this is my third time to do it, the census in, in Massachusetts. So I participated in 2000, in 2010 census, now in the 2020. And I'll be working for the halls in 2018, going through all the different organizations here in the city, encourage people to participate during the 2020 census. Here I bring a, a table here that we, for the first time, we gotta do online, the person has the opportunity to participate online by the phone or by mail to respond to the census uh, effort. It's especially important for the city to get an accurate account because we know the city of Brockton have more than 100,000 people living here. Most of the people, they don't wanna respond to the census for any particular reason. Most of them that we call in the census bureau, undocumented people. Their fear of the government and they don't respond. Happened in the past. We don't want this happening this time. We want to get an accurate account in that way that I can mention Councilor Thompson. We get the accurate and fair share of the money that the city receives when we see here all these projects that we have, especially school. Children, the Census Bureau, we got a program we call Census in the School or Statistics in the School. They got to start teaching the first week of March all the school in, in Brockton and across the country, across the United States how important is the census and how this kid take to the party and explain why it's important to complete the, the census questionnaire. So my best is that with this time we get it right and we get an accurate account for the entire city of Brockton, the entire population. Thank you, Pedro. Yeah. Any questions, councilors? Or <coughs> I, I, Mayor, do you have a statement beforehand? I, I do, or? If I could, thank you, Pedro. Um, a couple of things. Um, we have to make sure there's a distinction between the local census that the Elections Commission just sent out, and hopefully everybody sent it back, uh, you know, asks who lives in your household, do you have a dog, blah, blah, blah. That's the local census. We're talking about the federal census. I know there was some confusion. I think what Pedro said speaks volumes. Before it was just via mail. This is via mail or a phone call or an online. So we have three shots to really market this and explain the importance and the urgency of getting it right. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, Thank you, Madam. Before we take questions, actually, Eva, can you give everybody at home the information how they can go online yes. or a phone number because I, we don't have that. Um, so online, uh, www.2020census.gov will have all that information. It has also outreach materials for whoever wants to share that information and teach uh, and influence people in their um, in their area. Um, also, the from starting March 6th is when the invitations are going in the mail. So the census for the city of Brockton is circulating right now. The federal census has not started yet circulating. So the invitations are going out March 6th to March 12th. Uh, once those are out, people can start responding online. Uh, we already in partnership with Brockton Public Schools have an event on April 1st in April 4th at the new community center on um, at the North Junior High on Oak Street, um, and those events will facilitate, we'll have computers available, uh, teachers and paraprofessionals that speak different languages in our community to help uh, families fill out the census online, so no need to have internet access at home. Uh, also the uh, library, we have an event on February 25th, also an informational um, event. Uh, and on e different locations in different libraries, we'll have a computer. Uh, here at City Hall, we're gonna have a computer as well. So we're encouraging people to fill out the census online first. Uh, and if during that period of time that um, the invitations are going out for the online, if they cannot do it, then um, after April 6th is when the paper um, is going to come in the mail. And if they also need help with that. They only can fill out the census in paper in English or Spanish, but if um, they do it online or by phone, it can be done in 13 different languages. So that then again, we're encouraging people to do it online, so come to those events. Um, again, the 26th is important. Um, 
at the War Memorial Building on uh, West Elm Street. Um, and again, we're encouraging everyone that is a leader in the community come <coughs> that day to help us share this message and uh, encourage our Brockton residents to fill out the census. Councilor Fava. Uh, just a question, I think it would go to Pedro. Is, is there some degree of privacy though if someone fills out a census form? Because I know some people wonder, well gee, could that be list be sold? Could, could someone get a hold of it and then I'm gonna get slammed with telephone calls? <coughs> or I'd, I'd just like to reassure people that the, the data is collected for a very legitimate and important purpose and they are somehow protected? That's a very good question. The census above all is safe. Your responses to the census are completely confidential and are protected by Title 13 of US Code. Title 13 uh, provides the authorization for us to do the work that we do, but it also makes sure that your census responses are completely private. We are not authorized to share personally identifiable information or ad information that would identify an individual or a household with the public, with any government agency or court at the federal, state, or local level. More than that, every person that works for the Census Bureau, whether you work as a census taker or whether you work as a career in the Department of Commerce uh, on, this, on census issues, you swear an oath of confidentiality that you are, hold, you are held to for life. And to violate that oath, you'd be punished by five years in prison or a $250,000 fine. So we want to make it very clear that the census is safe to respond to. Your information, when you respond to the census, is totally secure. And the last question, uh, does the state cooperate and allow you, for example, to compare motor vehicle registration uh, info with residents in Brockton because someone might not be a registered voter, but they might have a vehicle registered to an address in Brockton. So is there that degree of cooperation between the state and the census or Am I in dreamland here? So we do, um, it's, it's, it's a good question, and we do a lot of work, uh, the Secretary of State's office, Secretary of the Commonwealth's <laughs> office, does a lot of work with our city and town clerks, uh, not just on voter rolls, but on our local update of census addresses. Um, so that is something that we do throughout the decade, uh, gearing up for decennial census, and we have over 130 surveys and programs throughout the year, uh, even when it's not a decennial year. Um, so those are often things that we're doing. Um, but we're also doing something called address canvassing, which happened over the summer uh, of 2019, where we were physically going out and trying to find, confirm good addresses and find any addresses where people might be living on April 1st that maybe weren't on people's records. And then we also work with the post office, making sure we have a list of all households. And remember, the mailing's gonna go out to households, not to individuals, if that makes sense. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Rodriguez. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I just want to, and I'm glad the mayor brought up the, uh, the fact that we are c currently doing the city census. And uh, the city census are important, but they're not as important as the, uh, the 2020 census. Uh, because we can do the city census next year again. And unfortunately, the census happens every 10 years. So whatever we sow, this year, we're gonna get stuck with this for 10 years. And one of the things that I, I too did some work with the Census Bureau uh, la the last time, 10 years ago, and <coughs> even beyond that, um, but one of the issues that we've had is people under-reporting. It's not that people were not filling out their census, but they were under-reporting, like where you have a household with you know, 10 people living in it, but they only have a two bedroom, they're actually reporting that there's only four people in that household, not the 10 that actually live in the household. And one of the things that I think we need to do is basically, I know that there was some um, influences in the past that uh, I remember several years ago, we were one of the last communities to set up a complete count committee and we were not really pushing the census the way we should be pushing it, not realizing that we've lost gazillions of dollars in federal census or in federal dollars into our community. Because it's not just, it's not just the federal dollars that come into a community. But if you notice, every time you're applying for a grant, even a state grant, they're always quoting census numbers. So those numbers actually reflect in dollars that are local dollars, even through foundations, through some of the other stuff that we applied for grants, they usually quote census numbers, not city numbers. Because we all know that the city of Brockton is over 100,000 people. Because if you look at the, the city of Lowell, for instance, Lowell is in the books for 108,000 people with 15,000 plus kids in their school system. How can Brockton with almost 18,000 kids in their school system be at 95,000 people? 
I mean, that makes no sense. You don't have to go to MIT to figure this one out, but I can tell you that the reason why we are at the level that we're in is because we're not reporting the numbers the way we should be. And I'm glad we took this effort, at least from the, from the city side of things. I think this is the first time we actually went as far as, as hiring somebody internally to deal with this. Uh, one of the conversations that I remember having with the department heads while I was in the mayor's office is that this needs to be a true community effort every single person. It doesn't matter if you're a police officer, a firefighter, if you work in this building, if you're a teacher, no, DPW, no matter, what, no matter what you're doing, once these, uh, this system opens up on April 1st, that everybody needs to get on board and get people to sign on to this thing. The life, the life of this city depends on this. It doesn't matter you know, how you feel about certain populations that will show up or not, but it's up to us to basically take away the fears. I mean, we, we have a large immigrant community in this community. It doesn't, the census doesn't care where you come from or how legal or illegal you are in this country. All we need to do is find out who the names are and where you're living, basically. And you can omit as much information from, those, uh, from the census that you want to, that you feel comfortable with. Nobody's saying that you got to go out and fill every single line of the census. If there's something that makes you feel uncomfortable, don't fill it out. But fill out your, the basic information so we can count every single person in this community. Because if we don't do that, this is a 10-year hit that we're taking. It's a 10-year hit, and there's no do-over. We can't go back and do it next year to try to make up what we lost this year. So I think it's an effort that we, we as elected officials, we as government employees, we as citizens of the city need to seriously put our differences aside, work for a common cause, because if we don't do this, we're hurting. And we were just talking about the school um, uh, renovation uh, at Brockton High School. How much, how much easier will it be if our numbers bump up to what it should be in terms of getting the funding that we need to, to, to get in order to get this stuff done? So I think we owe it to, um, some of us might not be here 10 years from now, but uh, we owe it to those that will be coming 10 years from now to make sure that they, they get the proper funding that they so rightly deserve in this community because we keep missing the boat on this. And we've got nobody to blame but ourselves for the last years that we haven't done this. And I'm telling you, it looks a lot nicer when we say officially so that we're not making this stuff up. There were a city over 100,000 people because the census numbers prove that. And I will, I will do what I can on my part, utilizing whatever language skills that I, I have or possess to make sure that every single citizen in this or every single resident of this city is counted and counted properly. But I think we need to basically you know, dismystify the fears that exist out there and basically let people know that this is one of the safest uh, projects in existence, that we are simply looking for bodies and numbers and not your status or whichever way you come or what your level of education is, but we need to do this together. And it has to be done on a joint effort by every single person that calls Brockton home. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council, you, you just summarized it 100% accurate. We, we've underreported, and when I met with the Secretary of State's uh, <coughs> office uh, just a few weeks ago, they, they echoed the same sentiments. Brock, and you didn't get it right 10 years ago. We hope that you do this time. You have three bites of the apple in terms of reporting accurately. Um, and again, you, Moses, you, you said it. I mean, it's not just the federal dollars, it's the local dollars. Um, you know, some people talk about maybe gaining a congressional seat. I don't really care about that. I care about the money for Brockton. Um, and I know Ed Miller, who's a Brockton resident, is here because they're actively looking to hire Brockton people, 20 bucks to 20, 22 to 24 bucks an hour to go out there for outreach. So I'm um, going to play. <laughs> so again, I just wanted to uh, thank you for your support and your collaboration. And, and if anybody, if Ed, if you wanted to, if the council Very president, good. Ed, mind. you'd like to tell us a little bit about job opportunities with the yes. 2020 uh, For those who don't know me, my name is Ed Miller. I am the recruiter for the city of Brockton uh, from the census. And I just wanted to share. We did have big issues 10 years ago, but I, in a conference call with my boss, it's being noticed how Brockton is coming together. And that is thanks to the interim mayor, our mayor now, who are both very positive. Thanks for the school committee and all your help. Um, we're showing good numbers and we need the uh, people who go out there and make the count. That's what's gonna make it. And because of all your help, with both mayor's help, 
we are on track to hit our numbers. Uh, and I'm going to have to say, since uh, my boss's bosses are happy, she's happy, and that makes me happy. And again, I just want to thank you all because we still have four to six more weeks. We still need to do a lot more. But with the positive attitudes and the positive help that I've been receiving from everybody, and, and I can't thank enough for your help and the help of the uh, departments here, I think we'll hit that goal. Ed, uh, can you tell everybody at home how they can find out to get information to work? Well, they can always apply uh, online at 2020census.gov uh, slash jobs, but the best bet is uh, to give their counselor a call because you have my number. And anybody calls you, give them my number because that will make it quicker. How about you give everybody your number? <laughs> sure. Uh, but again, you <laughs> it's know, a, it's 617-347-7294. I will return calls within a 24-hour period. Uh, again, though, um, I, I think we'll hit our goal, and I think that's going to happen. So we have enough people to go out in the city of Brockton and do the count. I think we're going to see that accurate number. Thank you very much. Thank you. Raymond, you had a question? Uh, if I, could just, if I could just add, uh, these jobs are very flexible for hours. You can work um, full time. How old? Uh, how, you have to be 18 years old. Yep. Uh, they're flexible. Uh, they're paid training, paid mileage. Um, you can work part time. Most of the positions will last roughly eight weeks. Some people will be hired for multiple operations and be hired for you know, a couple different uh, operations, but most of the positions will last about eight weeks. Uh, it's a good chance to make some extra money. You can work 10 hours a week, you can work 40 hours a week. Um, it's a good opportunity to make some extra cash. Thank you, and this is all, we're talking about the spring, the winter will be over, so. So it'll, we'll start, uh, some, <coughs> some operations will be starting uh, notifying people that they're hired uh, starting this month uh, and right through the end of, of March and April. Um, most of the counting will be done from the end of April until the end of July. Perfect. Thank you very much. Councillors, any other question? Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Uh, yes. <coughs> Motion's been made and properly seconded. <coughs> All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion carries favorably back to the full city council. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam Clerk, number nine. Resolved, the Brockton City Council adopts an official position that such a reduction in services contemplated is not in the best interest of our veterans and urges the Veterans Administration to reconsider its decision to consolidate and eliminate resources on the Brockton VA campus. Further, the Council, by this resolve, communicates to our federal legislative delegation the urgent need to reverse this potentially harmful decision. Invited, Corin Capiello, Director of Social Services, Richard Hand, Legislative Officer of the American Legion. Uh, before we start with this, I would just like to recognize that we have former Ward 5 Counselor uh, Ann Beauregard here in the chambers with us, so good evening. Uh, thank you for being here, Counselor. And uh, Mr. Hand, uh, I did have, somebody did bring up the question of why uh, the Veterans Services Director wasn't invited to this. So how the resolves work is they're put together by counselors and it's whatever the council, whoever the council wants invited is who we invite to the resolve. But um, if we have questions for Dave Farrell, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer them for us at a later date. But um, so that's the reason he's not here because he wasn't put down as an invited guest. Okay, uh, who'd like to go first? Oh, I was yeah, I just, I just, first of all, I just want to thank you. I mean, as you all know, um, we owe everything to the veterans. We all can agree on that. It doesn't matter what party you are. Um, and, and Richard has been um, at the forefront on that. Um, I did speak to Mr. Farrell, David Farrell, about this. And Corin has spoken to the representatives at the VA hospital as well, so she can opine and give information that they gave her. Um, and, and I just think this is a great sharing of information tonight for a very important topic. Thank you. Thank you, Maya. Good evening, Corin. Good evening. So I'm just going to be brief, and then if people have questions. So I just um, I want to thank all the veterans for their service. Um, and um, so I just wanted to give um, 
some brief stats on the champion plan because I thought that they were um, important. Um, so over the last, it's almost four years. Um, so over the last four years, we've had 837 individuals come through the champion plan and only 2% have uh, reported that they're veterans. Um, so I think that's important because, you know, I mean, it could mean that they're not reporting that they're veterans or it could mean that they're utilizing the services of the VA, which I think is wonderful. Um, and, you know, with that being said, you know, we, all, we want to always make sure that the appropriate services uh, are benefiting individuals. Uh, I did speak to the VA, uh, you know, and I want to make sure, I know Mr. Han has some information from them too, so I want to make sure that he, you know, speaks about that. But, you know, I, I do want to say that I, you know, I think it would be important to, you know, speak to the VA um, as well. You know, one stat I do want to bring up is that in, they, reported that in 2019, 70% of individuals that came in had a co-occurring disorder, so they had um, a substance use disorder and a mental health issue, um, so I think that's really important. Um, a lot of veterans, you know, do suffer from PTSD, depression, anxiety, um, and, you know, what they explained to me is that some of this, <clears throat> some of these changes or realignments um, are going to be able to serve individuals with co-occurring disorders better and also offer some outpatient services, medically assisted treatment, which is Suboxone, Methadone, Vivitrol, things like that. So I'll, I'll leave it like that. I know Mr. Hand is very passionate about that, this, which I love, so I will let him speak. Thank you, Corin. Good evening, Mr. Hand. How are you this evening? Good evening, Madam President and counselors. Uh, did you pass out your... Yes, so um, I did pass out everybody. I was able to get a hold of a communication that the VA had sent to the staff members over at building two, and we'll get that near the end so I can kind of poke some holes through this. Um, hopefully you packed a, a snack, because it's gonna be a long night. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so once again, um, on the reduction of numbers of beds and care for our veterans at the detox center, that was the scuttlebutt I've been hearing for a long time. Scuttlebutt, another, if you're not in the military, is another word for rumor or a water fountain, because room is started around the water fountain. So for the longest time, because I do a lot of volunteer work at Building 2, I do volunteer work at the Spinal Cord Injury Unit, and I also do with another program after detox, is called the REACH program, and some work at the Memory Unit at Building 4. My concern is in, I got many calls shortly after we, after the rumors started to pan out to be true, from veterans that unfortunately some of them use the detox, it's kind of a revolving door. Uh, one of them is a good friend of mine. He was a medical medvac and he has serious alcohol problems. One of his close friends had his head blown apart. He held him and that's what he suffers from with the PTSD. My concern is, you know, they, when I hear what I say, well, I'll poke through these numbers here. So my concern is loss of beds. They say they're going to gain beds. But if you're combining two mental issues and substance, who has priority over that? Uh, public hearings, um, talking to Corinne, she had talked to people at the VA. And if this was such a great idea, why wasn't it shared with the public? Um, I believe she said that they didn't know how to get in contact with public officials. This is a government agency that doesn't know how to get a hold of city hall officials, state house, which is, we're all supposedly in the government, and so that's a poor excuse, so that's telling me something is kind of not aligned here, what's going on. Um, we're all stakeholders, shareholders. Most of us in this room, I believe, still pay federal taxes, federal dollars, which is funding these programs. And I would hope that we would all want the best treatment and care. I could understand if programs have hit a dead end, whereas some of them it's a revolving door and we need to improve and tweak the way care is given. And it sounds like with outpatient that they would be probably maybe have come in daily for methadone and other treatment medications versus detox is usually 
three, seven day program, detox you off of it with three to seven days worth of medication, and then outpatient, or you can go on to what's called the REACH program. All is voluntarily on you. Nobody can force you to go through these. I guess maybe you can get court ordered to go into a program. Um, and once again, I find that at least with the Brockton VA, they like to keep Brockton in the dark. I don't know if you all recall when there was Legionella in the water. Um, they try to keep that hush hush. Um, once again, I had heard the scuttlebutt broke it to the newspapers, and then there was public hearings. Congress found out about it. So myself as a veteran, and I would hope that the leadership in Brockton doesn't like being kept in the dark with any such programs that is within the Brockton area. Um, so last weekend, last Saturday, I was contacted that they finally uh, did shut down the detox center and combined them into the psych ward. And the staff that was in the detox hasn't been assigned anywhere to go, so they're kind of probably repetitious. Everybody's doing the same thing, multiple people doing the same thing until they, I guess, kind of figure out what's going on over there. Um, once again, it's, you know, is addiction a disease or is it a mental health? Um, I'm sure there's combination, but will people want to go to a detox knowing that they're probably going to be labeled as some kind of mental issue versus uh, that, that's, that's a question. I don't know if that would stop veterans from going. I'm sure the beds are full right now in the winter time from volunteering up there. Both the detox center and the REACH programs are usually the capacity because a lot of them are homeless, want to get off the streets, and I don't want them by realigning and consolidating lose loss of beds. They say they will gain beds. I don't know how that's possible if you shut down a, a ward. Uh, building two is consistent of circa detox, a woman's unit where strictly women are only allowed on the floor. My DAV chapter, we have women and auxiliary veterans that go and work at the woman's unit. And also psych. There's the serious psych where they're the most violent ones, they're not allowed off the ward or off the campus. I've gone off the campus with other people from the detox or psych that aren't serious. We've taken them to hockey games. Um, now, some at the VA is saying that this might be illegal because they don't have approval of Congress. Not sure if this is true. I don't know if uh, anybody has any interest in looking at that from the wording in some of these letters that, that, that has been passed out. Once I heard about this, I did reach out to our mayor, and I reached out to Senator Brady and to Wynne Farwell. Immediately, Senator Brady called Congressman Lynch's office and said they were looking into it or working on this. So we'll, hopefully we'll find out more. Uh, but I say, you know, with the wording, maybe they're blurring the lines using the wording such as realignment and consolidations. Um, there's also a rumor right now that the VA is um, looking to close down a chronic floor on building two, second floor, B side. Uh, sounds to me like it's a little bit of a mess going on over there. But if this was a great idea, why we're if the shareholders, stakeholders, the city, the state legislators left in the dark. Um, now, some of the reasons that I heard why these changes were that there's been a hiring freeze, and the hiring freeze has been on for a long time. I frequently get my health care at Building 3, where primary care, dental, and eye is taken care of, and pharmacy and other services are in that building. They do post jobs. I see jobs posted all the time for in-house and for US citizens. 
So I don't know what they mean by a hiring freeze. Maybe they don't want to hide, hire doctors and nurses and psychological staff, and that's why where that building two is in the predicament they are. Um, another one is the safety, because Brockton VA, as you know, is no longer a full-time hospital. It's been labeled as an urgent care, and if an emergency happens after hours because the lab is shut down, um, you know, x-ray is shut down, why are you having veterans stay there at all? If you're concerned about ambulatory care for somebody that's in serious detox, comes in there, I hear the theory that, well, they're going to probably ship them over when they first come in, the ones that are really, really bad, send them over to West Roxbury and put, probably make some special ward over there because it would have to be locked for their safety and everybody else's safety. So if that was a concern for safety because it's not a full-time hospital, you don't have to call 911 for an, an emergency, why are we having any veterans sleeping over there at all? You get the memory unit over there. You get like a senior center. You get people going there for rehab after like a hip operation or maybe a heart attack and just had some stents put in. You got the REACH program. You got a RISE program, which is a continuation of the REACH program after you've gone through the detox. And if you want to further yourself, you can go into uh, the REACH program, which they help get you a government job. You work at the VA. You get a little stiff, and while you have to successfully go through programs, um, so, once again, public hearings, why were we left in the dark? I don't know if anybody here remembers in the year 2005, the federal government was doing what was called a CARES study. They were going through, picking so many states every couple of years for if I get the Ackman right, I think it was capital area reassignment to enhance services, CARES. Went through all of those meetings. It was chaos. Uh, Price Waterhouse Coopers was paid handsomely to do these studies. They were behind schedule. There was four meetings. And this is how they treated the veterans. These Price Water Cooper Waterhouse people showed up. Came lunchtime, they had a great catered lunch to them. Veterans were on their own, fended for themselves. Why taxpayers funded them to get money. Um, so, Pricewater Cooper House, um, they funded themselves. And the, the worst great idea they had was to shut down all the VA hospitals in Massachusetts and build one mega complex in Boston which never happened, so they, like I say, they were paid handsomely to say, leave things status quo. Two years, I know my friend Ann Beauregard was there when this was going on, when they were supposed to have plans and scenarios, they didn't, so they allowed more shareholders to give talks, and you know, a lot of it was a lot of people, because there was memory units, you can't even change the color of the paint and the walls without confusing people that have Alzheimer's and you want to put them in a concrete place in Boston. So that kind of, that was kind of a waste of time and a lot of fear. Um, once again, I'm wondering why is Brockton and its veterans kept in the dark? Um, we need to find a way to keep the lights on and keep the veterans out of the dark because there's no doubt Addiction is a very dark place, mm -hmm. and we're all dealing it with the Champion Program. We don't want people dying on the streets. We've got to come up with some answers, and I truly believe shutting down beds or realigning and consolidating is not the answer. How they gain beds out of the same space other than bunk beds, I don't know what goes on with that. Um, so this is why I'm here, to please let's find a way to keep the lights on, keep the communications open with a resolve um, that also that the city should be informed with small changes and little changes 
So then they could probably work through coordinating with the veterans service officer here in Brockton, Dave Farrell, to maybe send out a directive to the veterans on what's going on and maybe have a little input. But my concern is if, if it was truly a staffing issue, was any effort given to try to find funding through Congress? Because I'm under the assumption that this new administration is able to acquire a lot of funding in helping our veterans. We have a VA budget. Back when President Obama was president, he tried working what was called the Choice Program, which started another budget, a different checkbook than the VA budget. I actually used part of that Choice Program. It was a nightmare. They were approved care on the outside, say chiropractor, acupuncture, massage, or mental health facilities were approved. Providers never got paid for services that were approved. Piece of paper from the Choice Program saying you could do it. Pieces of paper from the VA saying go ahead and render these services. These providers no longer wanted anything to do with the VA. Now it's called the mission statement. So I'm wondering, is the VA trying to save their money in this budget and allowing outpatient now for detox so they can use another checkbook so they have more money over here? Granted, a lot of great stuff is done at the Brockton VA. I don't know if you've all noticed over the last couple of years, it seems like a long, drawn-out process, but they're building uh, MRI and a CAT scan units over there attached to building three, um, which is great because there was only one of those machines available, so this will hopefully lessen the wait for somebody that might be having a hip problem and they, you, know, you want to see better than an x-ray. All right, so um, this directive that I gave you, I kind of myself, um, you know, it's a substance use disorder, um, medical assistance therapy, so get them detox, kick them out the door, put them on some other alternative medication and, you know, less staff, move it along. I guess that's a good idea if they follow through with it. but. Mr. That Hansel, fall? What I think what we'll do is uh, follow up with the VA uh, hospital. I think if some counselors have uh, questions, I don't know if you, you know. But if you, you have a chance that, to read that, we'll you'll notice there. some of the words that I'm talking about okay. in there. And, and first you of know. all, thank you and thank you to all the veterans for your service to our country. We really, um, we're honored as we have a few colleagues that serve with us that are veterans. So this is a really important issue, but I think we have to really address it with, Directly, Mayor. Madam Chairman, first of all, I want to thank this is a very important resolve, and I want to thank uh, Council Rodriguez and Council Thompson for your service, and of course Richard uh, for his service, and also being a true advocate for the veterans. And um, we all concur; none of us would be here without the veterans. Um, so what I will pledge tonight as the mayor, I'll work with the council president to have a sit down uh, in my office with the executive director on site at the VA, along with uh, Claire Cronin, Jerry Cassie, Mike Brady, and Michelle Dubois. Um, we'll have a round table. We can invite Shana Barnes uh, on behalf, a former colleague, on behalf of Stephen Lynch as well, the congressman, to, to, to have a meeting of the minds. That way we can report back to the council you know, what their thoughts were, and we can be a strong advocate. I'll invite you, Richard, to be there as well at the table. So that's the best that I can do at I this think time. I that's, that's yeah, really that's great, Mayor. So thank for, you. you know, myself, I have one voice, mm -hmm. but if you're speaking for the whole city, if you all sign on to this, I think that shows a lot, and I think the veterans would appreciate that, you know, that we have their back, too. Well, definitely. Know. That's Move what we're here for, please. and that's our goal. So um, I know this was Councillor Farwell's uh, resolve. <coughs> Do you have any... Second. You, you can, Madam Chair, you can tell uh, Mr. Hand's passion. He brought it to Definitely. my attention. And I think having that roundtable discussion will let the VA know that we're focused on veteran services. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Lally, you had a I move to recommend favorably. Second. A motion has been made and properly seconded. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion carries favorably. Thank you again. Thank you for, Thank your, you for time. your service. God bless. Thank you.
Mayor. Council President, I just wanted to give the, the council uh, a quick update. Uh, today, uh, the city council clerk swore in three new Brockton police officers. So there was three new officers sworn in today, um, and, uh, and, and Manny Gomes, the chief, was here. Um, we're adding to the base, we're not subtracting, we're gonna keep doing that. Uh, as you know, I, I filed a, uh, I signed an order recently to have 14 more uh, from civil service go into the academy. So we are uh, we're actively working on that. I just wanted to give you a status update on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before the meeting, uh, just some information to my colleagues. I, uh, Chief Gomes was here in chambers and I think he uh, introduced a few of the officers to that would be direct contacts for us. He introduced them to some of the um, counselors and counselors that didn't get a chance to meet them. I will forward their information to uh, to all of us and update you in a, in a message, in an email, in a text message. So thank you. Thank you again. And Chief Gomes was here earlier at the beginning there's, of the There's going to be two Brockton police officers that are dedicated liaison to the council, uh, Scott Bezrick and, uh, and Mr. Lostrom, Ken Lostrom as well. So um, thank you for thank saying you. that. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. So, um, just a few pieces of information, counselors. I did. I attended the mayor's um, the uh, the mayor's anti-violence roundtable meeting uh, last week, and he is planning on having a citywide meeting soon. But in the meantime, I did want to inform everybody that Operation Safe Streets will be held on Wednesday. February 26th from 6.30 to 7.30 at the Arnold School. So that's always, um, that's happening every month. It's always on a Wednesday and it's with the DA's office and local law enforcement. It's, it's really a good, good meeting to attend. I know that our state delegation came up a few times in tonight's uh, conversation. So I would just like to take this opportunity to thank them, to thank uh, State Senator Mike Brady, our state reps, Claire Cronin, Jerry Cassidy, and Michelle Dubois for everything that they do. And uh, we do work in collaboration and it shows, you know, when as the superintendent stated, when we went up to the state house to uh, fight for our kids, they were there. They're a big part of what we do every day. The other um, announcement I'd like to, to make is early voting. So uh, March 3rd, 2020 is the presidential primary and we do have early voting in Brockton. It starts from February 24th to the 28th and it's at the Westgate Mall. It's actually in the location of the old Payless um, shoe store which is across from Super Dollar. So it's at uh, the old Payless. And the hours of voting are Monday, February 24th from 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m., Tuesday, February 25th from 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m., Wednesday, February 26th from 8.30 to 6 p.m., as well as on Thursday, February 27th from 8.30 to 6 p.m. But on Friday, February 28th, it's from 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. So, if, but if at any time, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to call the elections office at 508 Five eight zero seven one one seven to find out, you know, you know where exactly, or if you have any questions at all, they'll be more than happy to help you. Um, the other announcement I have is, yes, there was a meeting before our meeting this evening, and it was by Oak Colony Planning Council, and that also came up in tonight's discussion. Um, so the Oak Planning uh, Oak Planning. Council, Oak Colony Planning Council, had their Main Street Corridor study meeting this evening at the main library. It was at six o'clock, so I know the mayor was there, as he mentioned earlier, and Councilor Lally, but uh, for some of us that weren't able to make that meeting, if and people at home, because it, they weren't able to tape it, uh, have it televised, if you visit the their website, which is www.ocpcrpa.org, you can go on there and um, you can do the survey for the Main Street um, Corridor study, which is very important. They'll, it'll help them accumulate some uh, information. Did you want to? Council, I, I was remiss when I said Mr. Lally and uh, State Rep. Cassidy, you were there as well. Council President was there. No, no, but I want to thank you for being there as well. Mary Walden wanted me to pass that on as well. Thank you. Very much. Um, so that's any councilor's recognition? Councilor Cruz? Just a reminder the members of the Ordinance Committee that we'll have a meeting here tomorrow night at 6 o'clock here in the Council Chamber. Any other councilors? With no further business, this meeting's adjourned.